The Stobart juggernaut is trucking on. Away we go, then! Already a major force of both road and rail. Now, from their airport in Southend, they're reaching for the skies. Thank you. Thank you. What's next, please? They've new state-of-the-art kit to play with. It's nice to have a bit of new machinery, something that nobody's ever used before. So they're ready to take on the toughest tarmac. Whoa! Every time we hit a gust of wind, the steering wheel's going like the clappers. Wage war on the wildest weather. It's going to be fun today. And confront colossal challenges. Mental, this, isn't it? Now tell me I can't drive. The pressure is always on. We're not going anywhere fast. In fact, we're not even going anywhere slow at the moment. To keep this company running at full throttle. Push, push, push right down to the wire. Just keep going and fighting, fighting through it. 16.59, and that's to be here for five o'clock. Coming up, it's hit and missed for Craig Garside. You can't go early round the corner because you'll end up taking a car out. Swapping the classroom for his cab, Matt Eakins is back on the road, but is he heading in the right direction? I know how to get to Telford. I just don't know where I'm going when I get to Telford. It's mind over platter for dieting Dave Pickerel. We've been picking up a load of chocolate. Not really a good place to be going because I'm on a diet and everything. And the Welsh wizard Ashley Maddox prepares for the worst. So I'm expecting it to, uh, to be a different world on top of Sharp Summit. Every year, the company's biomass division supplies over 350,000 tonnes of recycled material to factories and power stations across the UK and Europe. But shifting biomass is messy work, so the drivers on this team can't be afraid of a little dirt. Dirty as anything. You look like a dustman when you finish with that one. But this is all part of the job for 33-year-old biomass tramper Craig Garside. I absolutely love my job. I won't do anything else. You learn something different every single day. It's 2.20 p.m. and Craig's on his second run of the day. He's at the Great Heck Clay Factory in his home county, Yorkshire. He's about to be hit with 26 tonnes of plasmal technic clay. Clay pellets to you and me. Really heavy stuff is this. I mean, it'll it load it within four minutes. But it's not the only thing Craig's been hit with. A home improvement accident has left him with a black eye. Last time I ever do a bit of DIY, I'm not a DIY person, I'm a lorry driver, so why I try it hand at that? That'll teach me. I've got a clunk on the head for it. Bulk material is hauled loose, so the first thing Craig has to do is open his roof. This weather's for ducks, isn't it, really? Roof off. Craig now has to work closely with the on-site loader. The lad there is going to guide me under, so he's got to make sure that the first slot hits me mat. But it's not a simple operation. Craig reverses his truck underneath a loading chute, and positioning is everything. To produce the pellets, the raw clay travels 250 metres on a system of conveyor belts to a kiln. Here, it is fired up to 1,200 degrees Celsius, and similar to popcorn popping, the clay expands and fills with air, creating the pellets. Each of the two kilns produces 25 cubic metres of pellets every hour. The clay pellets have a mixture of uses, from making concrete aggregate blocks to thermal insulation and roof gardens. To get an even distribution of weight on his truck, Craig inches forward. You can't have too much weight on your middle axles, or you'll be overloaded. You've got to keep an even weight. The legal limit for a truck and its load is 44 tonnes, so Craig is keeping a close eye on his onboard trailer scales. Yeah, this stuff goes in that quick, so you've got to watch him, watch the weight. 
about 25, 26 tonne at the minute. We can get another tonne on it, 25. We're about to get away with about another tonne. But calculating the correct weight with a load this fast is no easy feat. I'm going to be a good mathematician as well, and I'm not really good at maths. That's why I'm a lorry driver and I've been a math teacher, if anything. So I'm going to have to, have to use my toes and my hands to count this weight up. 38. 38. Loaded, Craig makes his way to the Weybridge for his final check before hitting the road. As long as I'm under, wait, well, hey, I'm not bothered. <laughs> the, the nightmares start when you're overweight. You're having to open that back door and get the stuff out. The last thing you want to do is have to take any of them off. You open the back doors, you'll get three ton coming flying off. It might need a crane to pull you out. It's the moment of truth for Craig and his calculations. Are we under? You've got 43,900, so you're spot on. Legal unloaded, Craig hits the road. Yes. From Goole, Craig will haul the clay pellets 156 miles to Tewkesbury in Gloucestershire, where he'll overnight. The next day, he'll travel 58 miles south to a concrete works in Yatton near Bristol. With a load this heavy, Craig's not taking it lightly. When you're fully freighted like this, it's going to take you a lot longer to stop. But if anything goes wrong and you drive like a complete tit, your show's going to be in front of the, uh, the judge, getting your bit of porridge. It's 4.30 p.m. Craig started his shift at 4 a.m. this morning, and he has to be at Tewkesbury by 7 p.m. tonight. We certainly don't want to be running over his driving times, because the last thing you want is to be parked on the side of a, a road, getting rocked to sleep all night. Not my idea of a good night's sleep. But on the M18, Craig's got bigger problems than where to rest his head. Oh, <laughs> well, my day gets absolutely fantastic. Truckers deal with hold-ups on a daily basis, but some delays are more frustrating than others. I don't know if this is a breakdown, an accident, but they all decide to stop and give it the old rubbernecking. Otherwise known as being nosy, rubbernecking is among the top causes of traffic jams in the UK. Probably some innocent person who's just got a puncher, but then they have to slow down to about five mile an hour, hold everything up and have a good look. And it looks like it was a puncture. It's now 5 p.m. Craig has to be off the road in two hours, and Dukesbury is still over 100 miles away. It's going to be close. I mean, that's knacker close. With the clock ticking and his driving hours dwindling, this trucker knows he won't make his planned overnight stop. It'd be, it'd be too tight to get to Chelsea. It'd be risking going over my driving hours, so I want to make a decision. I think I'm just going to pull it up early and park up at Coles Hill near Birmingham. Craig needs a place to park up for the night, and he wants to avoid the services at all costs. Thing about services, it costs an arm and leg. I'd rather keep my money in my pocket. Costing anything up to £25 a night is too hefty a price tag for Craig, even though the company would reimburse him. I mean, half the time, you go into a place, you're crammed for room, you park next to a fridge, and you go to showers in some places, and you... <laughs> and you won't even put a dog in there. Luckily, this tramper knows all the tricks of the trade. You always find little places where you can park up or where you know it's safe to park up. You keep these stored up here. That's how you avoid paying. But there's no guarantee that one of these secluded secret spots will be available. Good 18 months since I've parked up here before. And everything changes. If I can't park up round here tonight, I won't be happy. Coming up. It's gridlock for Matt Eakins on his first day back. Southbound's going all right, but the northbound is uh, knackered. And it's hit and missed for Craig Garside. You can't go early round a corner because you'll end up taking a car out.
to keep the company's fleet of 2,500 trucks moving 24 hours a day. There are 40 depots dotted across the country. The Crick Depot has relocated three and a half miles down the road to Rugby. And it's been operational for a week. My personal opinion, it's going to be absolutely blinding, to be fair. 36-year-old Matt Eakins is back on the road as a day driver. For the last 18 months, he's been based in the classroom teaching the company's drivers. But the tantalising tarmac has lured him back on the road as a day driver. It's good to be back with the, uh, the frontline troops, as it were. But before Matt hits the road, he wants to make sure his truck, Rachel Miranda, is looking her best. Well, I've been used to it for, what, a year and a half? I've had my little classroom and... The most active thing I had to do was plug the computer on. Truck-proud Matt's trusty steed is sparkling, but his handiwork means he's leaving the depot later than planned. Let's get out of this depot. <coughs> Once Matt finds his way out of the depot, it's a six-mile hop from Rugby to Lutterworth, where he'll collect a load of fizzy pop. He'll then travel 67 miles to a cash and carry in Telford, where he'll drop the pop. Then it's 25 miles to Cannock, Staffordshire, where he'll pick up a mixed load of supermarket products destined for the company's warehouse on the outskirts of Rugby, 51 miles away. First day back on the road, and um, it's raining. I don't know whether uh, the man above is trying to tell me something, you know what I'm saying? I just want today to run smoothly. That's all I'm asking. That's all I want. At 7.30 a.m., Matt arrives at Lutterworth. Just in time for the kettle. Woohoo! 50 minutes later, he hits the road with his load of soft drinks. We rock and roll to Telford. Happy days. Matt's due in Telford at 9 a.m., but with 67 miles to go and a limited speed of 56 miles per hour, he's going to be at least an hour late. And to make matters worse, it's morning rush hour. Just joining the M6, the infamous M6, and uh, as per usual, it's solid. I'm honest, I haven't really missed this in the past year and a half, but it is what it is, isn't it? Obviously, southbound's going all right, but the northbound is... Uh, ..knackered. Matt's first delivery in 18 months is not going to plan. Yes, my first delivery... ..and I'm late. <clears throat> Nobody likes to be late, don't get me wrong, but... ..yeah, I would like to have been uh, on time or... Early, if you will, for my first delivery, but hopefully we get past this. Leaving late from the depot and bad traffic means he's not going to hit his 9am delivery slot. Time to call his planner. Hi, are you all right? I am, sir. Um, what's the reason for your delay? Yeah, I've had a few issues. It's been, uh, it's been a bit of a funny old morning, really, so that's why I'm late. Luckily for Matt, she's about to throw him a lifeline. You're going to get there for 10 o'clock, is that right? Yeah, 10 o'clock, I should be there. She's called ahead and arranged for him to drop his load an hour later than planned. One crisis averted, but now his internal sat-nav is on the blink. I know how to get to Telford. Ish. I just don't know where I'm going when I get to Telford. Up against the clock and in unfamiliar territory, will Matt be able to truck his way out of this one? Find out later. On the outskirts of Birmingham, Craig Garside is hunting for his hideaway. I just can't remember where it is. But it's been a year and a half since he last spent the night there. Well, that's always a bad sign. Laybys are busy already, so a lot of people know about this place. With his legal driving time rapidly running out, if his parking spot is taken, he might be getting rocked to sleep by the roadside tonight. Or worse, have to pay for services. Let's have a look here. Hey. <laughs> Result. He's got it. With 35 minutes to spare, Craig finds his hidey hole for the night. 
nice and quiet. Camera's over there and over there, so I know I've got pretty much security. He may not have got as far as he wanted to, but at least he can sleep safely tonight. My plan for now is get my curtains drawn, get some scran, and then get my little head down for night. That's me done. It's 5 a.m. and Craig Garside is determined to make his delivery 109 miles away on time. I got up about half past four, between four and half past four this morning. It is quite common for us to have early starts like this. Any later, we'll be stuck in traffic. You don't know what's going to happen around corner. On the M5, this early bird might have an open road. Problem is, he can't see it. Got a bit, uh, bit of fog just coming from uh, nowhere. Fog not only restricts visibility, it also distorts what you can see, making it difficult to assess speed and distance. Once off the motorway, the fog becomes thicker and the danger greater. Being a small road, I need to use most of the road. So, you can't go early round a corner because you'll end up taking a car out. You've just got to have your wits about you and I always think there's going to be somebody around that corner. Craig isn't about to throw caution to the wind. He slows down in anticipation of oncoming traffic. Nasty little left-hand turn here. You can't see what's coming round that corner. The extreme conditions force him to reduce his speed to a snail's pace. Despite the fog, Craig's early start means he arrives at the concrete works bang on time. Here we are into our destination. To unload, he has to reverse his 16 and a half metre long truck and trailer into a busy goods yard. Quite a, a tricky manoeuvre this because I'm going to use the space I've got, but I've got to do some on my blind side, which I can't see. And guess where the trailer's going? I've got vehicles parked here, so it could be quite tricky actually. But it's not just trucks that he has to look out for. Because of where these bunkers are positioned, you can't get a straight run up it, so you've got to come in at an angle. So if you keep over to, if you if you overturn it slightly, you can make a right dog's ass of it. No parking space is going to get the better of this trucker. Bang on that. Now it's just the small matter of unloading 26 tons of clay pellets. Like that. Knee deep in it. It'll stop so, I think. With 26 tons behind them, the clay pellets pour out of the truck unaided. It's like climbing Everest. To push out the rest of the load, Craig kickstarts his old friend the walking floor. But to get the dregs of the load out, he does it the old-fashioned way. Now the fun bit. I wonder how much it's left on. To eradicate the load completely, he's going to have to put his back into it. And this stuff weighs an absolute ton. It don't look a lot. But you've got some weight you're pushing in there with a brush. It keeps me fit anyway, doesn't it? You know what I mean? You can't just be sat at wagging all day eating pies like Tim. Job done, and the time has come for Craig to do what every trucker does best. Put the kettle on. Favourite bit about my truck. Oh, best thing in this truck is that, the kettle. Can't beat it. Coming up, Matt's in a muddle on his first day back. So when we got here, we went to uh, B Shed. <clears throat> they told me to come over to C Shed. The C Shed had told me to go back to B Shed. It's all right, brief. Just relax. And there's a calorific load that could push Dave Pickerel off the dieting wagon. Now that chocolate's off the menu when you're on a diet. Your temptation is just to go in the back and just have a good sniff at it, really. Obviously, we can't touch Emma because that'll be, be naughty, then.
This fleet covers a distance of over 200 million miles per year. And much of that mileage is notched up by the company's 750 trampers. You know, you, you basically like just finishing work and going straight to sleep. Most trampers are attached to their trucks, but none more so than 42-year-old petrol head Dave Pickerel. Why not drive something that I love driving instead of just driving a, a car or a van? I drive a 44-ton truck. This is a beast. It's 4.30 a.m. and Dave has been on the road for over two hours. He's arrived at his home depot, Stoke, so he gets a glimpse of his pride and joy as he sets off. Just wave goodbye to me car as we go past it on the left-hand side. That's my car there. But there's still a lot to do before car-crazy Dave will get to sit behind that wheel. We're under a bit of a pressure today because I'd like to go home tonight as opposed to being parked up again tonight and spending another night out. Today, Dave's got less than seven driving hours left to complete his journey. From the Stoke Depot, he'll travel 54 miles to a distribution centre in Nottingham. Then it's a 24-mile journey to the company warehouse in Barden, Leicestershire, where he'll be loaded with chocolate destined for a supermarket in Litchfield, 30 miles away. Then it's a 36-mile sprint back to the Stoke Depot in Staffordshire. He'll have to be there by 3 o'clock if he's to make it home tonight. One of the good things about starting early in the morning is there's absolutely no traffic about it. The roads are empty, we can get to destinations quicker. His goal is to make it back to the Stoke Depot today, but it's not the only goal he's striving for. Um, the diet's still going good. Nearly four months ago, Dave embarked on a gruelling weight loss programme. He's turned his cab into a mobile gym pumped iron with a sliced white and swapped sweet treats for potassium-rich bananas. I've lost approximately two stone now since, uh, since starting in January. Um, I think I'm about... probably about 15 stone now, so that's good. Um, I still haven't reached my target weight yet. His aim, to shed the kilos and get buff for summer but avoiding the traditional trucker's tucker isn't easy. Kind of miss the bacon sandwiches, but we do, I do occasionally have them with like a little bit of a treat, but it's not very often no more. But how will this trucker cope with temptation? When we go to Barden, we'll be picking up a load of chocolates and everything from there. Not really a good place to be going because I'm on a diet and everything. Your temptation is just to go in the back and just have a good sniff at it, really. Dieting Dave's been on the road since 2 a.m. and his thoughts turn to food. I mean, it's dinner time now, really, for me. I've been going six hours because it's nearly eight o'clock. Where all you lot are just having your breakfast at eight o'clock, I'll be having my dinner. On the M1, Dave's imagination begins to run wild about the Barden warehouse. You know, I suppose it's going to be like just a, a chocolate heaven, really, and, and smells all chocolatey. It's going to be a bit like Willy Wonka chocolate party, but obviously not with the chocolate fountain and, you know, with, with the chocolate stream running around and definitely not with the, all the umpa lumpers and everything working there. Mind you, some of them do, probably do look like umpa lumpers. At 10 minutes past eight, Dave arrives at the Barden warehouse. So, as long as you're out to be here by 10 o'clock, you know, it shouldn't really be cause any problems, I don't think it's serious. Covering over 675,000 square feet and split between import and export areas, this Chocoholics paradise is one of the biggest confectionery warehouses in the country storing over 133 million chocolate bars. This is where all the Easter stock comes in, all the Christmas stock, all the seasonal stuff for all the kids to enjoy at Christmas and Easter. One man who is surrounded by this chocolate treasure trove every day is shift supervisor Gavin Broughton. At the minute, all the Easter stuff's flying out. As you can see, we've got all the Easter eggs ready for all the kids to go and buy at the shop. So. No, I'm sure if they came in and seen that, they'd get a bit excited, wouldn't they? I know I do when I see it every day. Whilst Willy Wonka let his chocolate run free, here everything is packaged, sorted and stored, ready to be distributed to customers all over the world. Probably nowhere on the world map that you could put a pin in, apart from the Antarctic, that we don't send our stock to. 
The warehouse runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To store and distribute this volume of chocolate takes some serious equipment. This clever piece of kit known as the crane means that half of the warehouse is completely automated. As date prioritized orders come in electronically, the central computer activates the cranes. The automated cranes collect stock from an area known as the high bay that's 32 meters tall and can store up to 56,000 pallets. Whereas the single cases are picked by hand and it takes some muscle power. Just make sure you have your wheat a bit in the morning. Once the picker has completed the order, the load is ready for transport. I'm just going to wrap the pallet up and get it ready to be put on the trailer. While Dave's trailer is loaded with over 43 million mouth-watering calories of chocolate, Dieting Dave stops at the cafe for a healthy alternative. Watching his waste, Dave's willpower is put to the test. Please. Can I just have an apple, please, Doc? Resisting temptation, Dave hits the road. But for a chocolate load this great, he needed a higher trailer, and the swap has set him back. It's now 10.30 a.m., and he needs to be in Litchfield, 29 miles away by 11 o'clock. Things that we don't want to see and now while we just up against it a little bit with the time are roadworks, any accidents, any, any kind of congestion, really. But before he's even made it to the motorway, he comes to a standstill. We're just hitting a bit of traffic now, which is not what we really wanted, so we just got to keep an eye on the time now. It's 10 minutes to 11 now, and he's still 20 miles away from the supermarket. It's out of my hands, you know, I can't drive over these roadworks or anything. It's not long before Dave manages to break away from the roadworks, giving him a chance to open up the throttle of his chocolate chariot. I've got to do the best as I can now. Now we're back on the road again. All these hold-ups may scupper Dave's plan of making it home tonight. Still under a bit of pressure now for me getting back to Stoke or getting parked up before three o'clock, really, because of my driving hours. Eleven forty a.m. Forty minutes later than hoped, Dave arrives at the supermarket in Litchfield. Once he's tipped his load, he'll be on the home straight. The supermarket gets their load. Over an hour later, Dave is still craving his own bed. We've got an hour and three quarters left before I've got to either park up or get myself off home. He charges up his 440 horsepower beast. He'll have to be at the Stoke Depot by three o'clock if he's to have any chance of sleeping in his own bed tonight. It's always nice just to go home for one night and sleep in a proper bed instead of on a little confined space like I've got behind me. If any trucker can make it happen, it's car enthusiast Piston Pickerel. Knowing all the back roads and everything, you know, like the main A roads to get you around places is great. If we went the motorway, we could be stuck up on there, anything from an hour and a half up to two hours in the traffic on a Friday. With just under 30 minutes to spare, Dave arrives at the Stoke Depot. And after sleeping four nights on the road, it's home sweet home for this trucker. Looking forward to getting off home. It's been a long week and done lots of hours so far, so it'd be good to just to get off home early, but having started early this morning. Finally, Dave is reunited with his loved one. Whether a 44-ton truck or a two-litre turbo engine with 326 brake horsepower, there's nothing too big or too fast for this trucker. At least this one goes faster than 56 miles an hour. Thirty-five miles away on the M6, Matt is fighting the traffic on his first day back. He's due in Telford at 10 a.m. We're cruising at an average speed of 30. Yeah, I hope we're coming towards the end of it now. We should do us uh, big favours. Thank you very much. We are in not-so-sunny Telford. Matt arrives 20 minutes later than scheduled. Not ideal on your first day back. A few minutes late, but uh, I hope it won't be too harsh on me. Oh, 
Quicker we get it done, quicker we can have a little break. While his trailer is being unloaded, he bumps into an old trucking buddy. How come you've uh, gone back driving then, Matt? Missed you, boys. Yeah. No, seriously. No, I just, uh, mate, I missed the banter and, yeah, I missed driving. I got jealous. You boys have it so easy, so I thought, sod it, I'm going to go back onto that. <laughs> Matt managed to find Telford, but will he be able to find his next pickup point in Cannock, 25 miles away? I don't, um, I generally don't do getting lost. You know, I just take the uh, wrong turning every now and again. <laughs> to be fair, I can get lost in a bloody car park, I can, but there we are. I say, so far, so good. Satnav was telling me to turn right there, but I don't think that's correct. Matt arrives in Cannock at 1 pm and collects his mixed load bound for his last drop of the day at the company's warehouse on the outskirts of rugby. Well, consider I'm on the home straight now, so I'm give or take about an hour away from the yard. I've got plenty of time left to get back. Worst scenario, the country comes to a standstill and I don't make it home. But let's face it, it's not going to happen, is it? Oh, touch wood, touch wood. It's 2.22 p.m. and Matt, still 44 miles away from his final drop, hits traffic again. Just watch the clock tick by whilst we sat still. But um, we're getting there, we're getting there. Fortunately, the traffic clears and he arrives at the warehouse at 3.30 p.m. But it's not quite job done yet. Let's come on to sea shed. That's what we're told to do. And we're at the wrong place. So I've just got to go to the, uh, the shed just across the road into B shed. Matt finds himself on a bit of a wild goose chase. So when we got here, we went to uh, B shed. <clears throat> they told me to come over to sea shed. The sea shed had told me to go back to B shed. So we're going back to B shed, but they're going to tell me to go to C shed. Well, C shed is to the B shed, and B shed for the C shed. It's all right, brief. Just relax. Let's go and see Scott. Come on in. Let's go and see Scott. When confusion descends, there's only one person to go to. Groupage forklift driver Oracle Scott Heslop. Dropping off. Well, I haven't done one of these before, you see, so I don't know what the crack is. Yeah, you're dropping off. So you want to put it in that bay there? Drop it. Drop it. I'll open the door for you. Thank you, Scott. And then I'll uh, sort it out from there on. With a not altogether trouble-free first day under his belt, has the lure of the tarmac lost its luster? Yeah, it can be a little bit tested. It's character building. Let's call it character building. We don't throw our teddies out at all. <clears throat> You keep it cool, you have a bubble, and uh, where you go. Jobs are done. Coming up, temperatures drop. It's starting to snow, you know, quite heavily now. As Ashley Maddox reaches the top. So I'm expecting it to be a different world on top of Sharp Summit. The company delivers 25 million pallets of goods to supermarkets annually. To make this happen, it takes over 4,500 truckers pounding the tarmac all over the UK. And the pressure is always on to get the goods delivered on time. Take every day as it comes, take it in your stride. One trucker who always likes to be punctual is 45-year-old tramper Ashley Maddox, AKA the Welsh wizard. The best thing about being a tramper is you get to see a lot of the UK. It's 6.30 a.m. at the Carlisle Depot, and Ashley has a big drive ahead of him. I better get my skates on. I don't want to be late. Today, from the Carlisle Depot, it's a 16-mile hop to Armathwaite in Cumbria, where Ashley will collect a load of spring water. He'll then travel to Weybridge, 306 miles away. Our booking time is for 1800 tonight, and Weybridge 
at 1800 is, is like a no-go area. It's kind of just one road in, one road out. Ashley's been a trucker for 24 years and a tramper for 14. He knows the motorways inside out, but his heart lies in the countryside. It's nice to get a bit further north. I've, uh, that, that's all I've done for the last few weeks is London, London, London and more London. So it's nice to get up out in the countryside. You know, I, I prefer uh, green grass and trees to uh, concrete and traffic. After 40 minutes, Ashley arrives in the rolling hills of Cumbria. Fantastic location. 200 years ago, the Lake District inspired the writings of William Wordsworth, and it seems Ashley Maddox is quite impressed too. You couldn't wish for a, a nicer front door, you know, for your factory. You know, what an office. We look at this every single day. Don't get a stressed out uh, forklift driver in this place. He arrives relaxed and stress-free. A quick 10 minutes later, and he's fully loaded. But with 24 tonnes of water on his back, Ashley's stress levels are on the rise. For 26 pallets of um, bottled water, is, uh, it's not going to be a light load. Bit of a tight turn out of here now. might have made it out of the factory in one piece. But there's a bigger problem afoot. Got some quite steep hills to, uh, to uh, be confronted with here. The acceleration is, is kind of non-existent. You roll down the hills and then it can hardly get back up the other side. It's not just the hills that could hold this trucker up. A bit of a mixed bag of weather it's trying its best to snow. I think there is a forecast for quite a lot of snow by the end of the week, but uh, I think it's just arrived now. Ten miles down the M6, and the weather takes a turn for the worse. Uh, it's starting to snow, you know, quite heavily now. Oh, I can see the further we're going along, it's starting to settle on the hills there. I'm expecting it to, uh, to be a different world on top of Sharp Summit. At over 400 metres above sea level, Shap Summit is one of the most dangerous sections on the M6 motorway. Bit of haze ahead of us. Uh, obviously, that's the, uh, that's the snow uh, being blown around and a bit of low cloud as well. He makes it to the peak unscathed. On his descent, the weather clears and he makes up the lost time. And then you drop down the other side and yeah, everything's hunky dunky dory, then we're okay. It's been thirsty work tackling the Cumbrian hills, but Ashley knows the perils of drink driving, and that's just the water. I try not to uh, drink too much through the day because I would probably find myself stopping at every services on the way down to use the uh, toilet facilities. It's uh, nothing worse than you think, what could do with using the loo, and then the next thing you pass a sign, service is 27 mile. That can be the, tw the longest 27 mile of your life. Thirty miles later, Ashley pulls into the Appleton depot to refuel his truck Get some fuel inside. and relieve himself. Well, that talk of the loo now, I'm getting a bit, uh, a bit close to it myself. Mind you, it's not doing me any good watching all this liquid pour into the tank. It takes 480 litres of diesel to fill a truck this size. God, oh, come on. And can take up to five agonising minutes. <sighs> Seems forever filling this tanker. My poor old bladder's full to the brim, but uh, it's going to take longer to fill this up. Heck of a lot longer. Thank God for that. With his truck full, all he wants is to be empty. But he can't leave the truck at the fuel pumps. Now, here's a task now, reversing with a full bladder. Oh. And the bigger the gap, the more, the more you, uh, you make a mistake. I'm going to the toilet. Finally, Ashley can make his bladder gladder. That's as far as you can be. Pea 
peace at last. Looks better, I feel like a new man now, oh God. Right, I'm gonna grab a bite to eat. Relieved and refuelled, Ashley hits the road heading south on the M40. So we're getting uh, closer and closer to a rather quaint little village with, uh, um, you know, a bypass around it. I think it's called London and the bypass is the M25. So I'm keeping my old fingers crossed that uh, this, uh, this M25 is moving. The M25 circles London and it's the busiest motorway in the country, especially at rush hour. For God's sake, don't stop because if it stops, we could end up running out of driving time and that's the last thing you want to happen. Nobody wants to be late for the delivery. It's now a quarter to five and Ashley needs to be at the drop-off point by 6 p.m. This time of night, you've got uh, just masses of traffic pouring off all these junctions onto the M25. My hopes are not dashed at the moment. It'll, it'll pick up a move. It's got to. With traffic as far as the eye can see, there's no telling how long Ashley will be held up. It can get a little bit frustrating sometimes when you've done such a long journey, you've had such a good run, and then all of a sudden, you're faced with this. Um, you're so near yet so far. But it will pick up, it'll move along again. Once he's off the M25, things are looking up for Ashley, and his destination is finally in sight. So we're literally a couple of minutes away now. After a gruelling nine-hour drive, Ashley has finally made it. And we've done it with about nine minutes driving just <laughs> The bottled water from the Cumbrian Springs successfully makes it to the supermarket shelves. Despite the ups and downs of the run, it's all in a day's work for this seasoned trucker. Fortunately for us, the canteen is open, so I'm going to go in there, sit down, have a, a nice sit-down uh, evening meal, and then hopefully by the time we come back, the truck should be empty, keys back in, boys, gone. Next time, ex-serviceman Jimmy Callahan's ice cool starts to melt on a treacherous run down the M6. Whoa! Every time we hit a gust of wind, my steering wheel's going like the clappers. Keep your wits about me in this, I think. Day driver Eddie Murphy is up against it, helping the brew through to Glasgow. You do have a cut-off point roughly about six o'clock. We will need to make a move a little bit. And will waste warrior Tim Fox be driven round the bend? Oh, I can't go.